Hi, I'm Ted Haftegaber, founder and producer of Live Talks Los Angeles. Thanks for joining us. Since we started over a decade ago, we have brought you hundreds of conversations with storytellers, writers, actors, musicians, humorists, chefs, and thought leaders in business and science. You can watch and hear most of these in our YouTube channel and our podcast. For details, visit livetalksla.org. And now, Here's the show you've tuned in to see. We welcome David Copperfield and Richard Wiseman to Live Talks Los Angeles. They'll discuss David's book, David Copperfield's History of Magic. David has been hailed by critics as the greatest illusionist of our time. He has won 21 Emmy Awards, was the first living illusionist to be given a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame and was named a living legend by the United States Library of Congress. Richard Wiseman, also a co-author on David's book, is an experimental psychologist, best-selling author, and is also a magician. His books include The Luck Factor, 59 Seconds, and Paranormality. He is a member of the Inner Magic Circle, a director of the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, and has published over 100 academic papers and articles. He also acts as a creative consultant, including work on The Twilight Zone and the hit television show, Brain Games. They will talk and also include some questions sent in from the audience. I'll let you take it from here, Richard. Thank you, and a pleasure to be here. Um, and greetings from the UK. I'm uh, Richard Wiseman, psychologist and uh, a magician, and uh, co-author of uh, David Copperfield's uh, History of Magic, which is what we're going to be on, uh, focusing on today. Talking of which, uh, joining me, I believe from Vegas, is the legendary David Copperfield. Uh, hello, David. How are you? Nice to be here. Very good. And can you tell us, first of all, where, where do we find you in, uh, in Vegas? Where are you? This is the place, the recreation of the place that started me off. This is the recreation of Cannon's Magic Shop, which uh, existed on 42nd Street in the old Wurlitzer building in New York, which doesn't exist anymore. Uh, there's still a, a really terrific Cannon's, but this is the one that I recreated that is the kind of the spark that started my career off. And I've recreated here as the kind of the entryway to the museum because it was the entryway to my uh, career. And, and we should tell folks about this museum. We, we're going to talk a lot more about it later on, but just as a, a little tease, it's, it's a secret museum. It's, it's a magical museum. Can you, you you're sitting in, in one part of it. Can you give us a, a feel for how big that museum is? It's really, really big. <laughs> That's a technical term within yeah. magic. It's a, a gigantic museum. There's hundreds of thousands of items uh, uh, from everything from uh, Houdini and Keller and Thurston to the, the golden age of magic to contemporary magicians, magicians who started on television, magicians who created, helped to create movies as we know them, um, and smart homes, all kinds of technological things that magicians have, 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 have been at the core of. And uh, we're, both you and I are very proud of the fact that uh, magical thinking has done so much for not only theater, but also uh, technology and uh, a way of thinking about the future. And, and it is an astonishing museum. I've been fortunate enough to, uh, to look around it a couple of times. I mean, it's the kind of Smithsonian of, of, of magic. Uh, because the nature of, of magic, there's a lot of secrets embedded. So normally you can only give private tours. Yeah. And in the book, you're taking, uh, giving people really a personal tour th through the museum. Exactly. And, you know, all the people here that we talk about uh, are people that kind of are inspirational, uh, kind of... Uh, uh, <laughs> questionable, all kinds of different personalities that were involved in this art form. Uh, all very interesting. And uh, I think uh, uh, I, I love all the stories that we were able to tell. Um, when I first started this museum, I really didn't get it. You know, I, I bought a collection to, to save it, to preserve it. Um, and then I started to understand the lives of all these individuals. And uh, I was blown away. And I re really was motivated to keep creating more things and uh, uh, expanding this place. And it's a, a great place to, to, uh, to share all these amazing stories. People that come here are, are people like J.J. Abrams or, or um, you know, filmmakers, uh, 
um, uh, historians. Uh, and again, because there's so many secrets here, I have to do exhibitions outside of here. I've taken parts of this and done exhibitions in New York and LA, all that. But to come here itself, we only do private tours. And uh, this book actually is a way of getting a tour, a private tour for people that maybe not get a chance to come here themselves personally. And, and we should say that the book is co-authored uh, with another Brit, actually, David Britland, uh, and also has astonishing photographs in there by, I, I think, your, your director of um, photography, uh, director of uh, design, Homer. Yeah, Homer Leweg, my co-director for my show, actually. Homer Leweg did an amazing job with all the different pictures, kind of trying to take you into this place visually with double page spreads and so forth. And uh, it's pretty cool. We're real proud of it. Had done an astonishing job. So uh, obviously it takes people into the secret world of magic and the outsiders and, and as you say, some of the, the questionable characters that, uh, that populate that world. It's a world you've been in a, a, a long time uh, since uh, you were a, a kid. Half a century. Uh, I, Half a century. <laughs> I've got a, a picture here, a photograph here of, uh, of a young chap that you may recognize. Hopefully you can uh, hold it up here. Hopefully you can uh, see this young chap here. So... So weird. What a weird kid that is. <laughs> uh, this I like is make friends. <laughs> this is this is a very young uh, David Copperfield. How old would you have been in that photograph? I don't know, like 12 or something like that. Yeah. What do you think? I um, I don't I don't know. Yeah, maybe 10, 12, something like that. And you're doing you're doing doves at that age? Yeah, yeah. I had two doves in a drawer in my bedroom. We have a silk handkerchief like clipped with um, with uh, clothespins to keep them from jumping out and they cooed all night to sleep that was my then i have to clean out the the drawer i didn't even buy a cage it was really not very good but anyway they were my <laughs> pals i loved them and now they are uh, somewhere else and you you're working then as uh, davino the boy magician i believe i was davino the boy magician children's parties balloon animals um and uh all of them look like poodles, all the balloon animals, you know. It's, it's normally a poodle or a giraffe, yeah. is my understanding. That's, yes, yeah. And if you turn and, the giraffe this way, you get a dachshund. <laughs> and uh, Davino, was, was, was that your idea for a stage name? Oh, my father's idea. Uh, in a Jewish household, my father wanted to be Italian. All his friends were Italian. So he said, well, you're going to be Davino. Sounds more Italian. <laughs> well, I'm going to take you back uh, to uh, February the 22nd. Apparently, you're 12 years old and you're at uh, the uh, Wachang Hills Regional High School. I'm sure you remember it well. A program, Magic and Movies, sponsored by the American Field Service. <laughs> now, apparently, that's your first show. Okay, maybe. It's, it's very possible. I, I, I don't remember that exact show being my first show. I think I did a couple of birthday parties. Before that, maybe it's for first public show. Did they charge in that ad? Is it is they charging money for it? With it doesn't. Food? It doesn't say. It doesn't say in the um, in the ad. Um, I don't know. It's. it's I, I, I don't know what the American Field Service is either, being uh, from the UK. But uh, yeah, they they booked you, but you don't remember if it, uh, anything about the show. Yeah, I, rem I remember my show at the time. You know, I was in competition with a, a couple of young magicians who, who called the Greenhouse Twins. It was a magician and a ventriloquist, these two twin boys. And I just recently kind of reunited with the one that's still alive uh, and told him that I was really jealous of them so much because that's beautiful advertising, amazing advertising brochures and cards, beautiful. And they got all the jobs because the advertising was so good. Even at my own temple, my own synagogue that I got permission for, they got hired. In my <laughs> <laughs> and... I said to him, how did you get such beautiful advertising? And he said to me, my father was a printer. Oh, oh so, you didn't yeah. stand a chance. No chance. Uh, but the Greenhouse Twins, uh, you know, one of them is still around and uh, he's sending me his, his material for my museum. I'm going to archive his, their life here <laughs> in the museum because they really like, I would sit there like really upset that they would get all these jobs and nobody would hire me. But I guess the Watch Hung Hills uh, American Field Service went with the, this, this kid, and I guess I did the show, yeah. Absolutely. And, and things have worked out, worked out well since then. Um, if, if you were to go back uh, and, 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 and speak to yourself then and say, hey, look, you know, don't worry, you are going to become 
the most legendary magician of all time, the most successful magician of all time. Yes, You're going to be performing, no, no, no. I mean, forming, you know, hundreds of shows uh, uh, every single year, touring all over the world, all these awards. What would, what would 12-year-old uh, Davino have said to you? Or what I've said to Davino. Well, you, if, you, if you told Davino that, would Davino believe you? Oh. Did you have that kind of self-belief as a child? No. No, because I, I, not, not all kidding aside, you know, I didn't think there was the possibility to, to have a, a career beyond doing a little act and making a living doing a 10 minute act in a show. I, that wasn't even a, in the, it wasn't a possibility. So, um, no, I mean, I, I idolized Gene Kelly and Fred Astaire and Frank Sinatra, people who did have careers that were beyond a 10 minute act. So maybe that helped the story. But, you know, what I would have told my younger self was that, um, you know, first of all, Everything's important. Pay attention to your haircut. <laughs> Pay attention to your clothes. Uh, let me see that picture again. Put, put that picture up one more time. Oh, look. That's how I look. Here we are. Put that up again. Don't wear a bow tie or a ruffled shirt. Don't do that. Oh, you're being harsh on 12-year-old self here. We, we all used to dress like this. Every, every, every kid is into magic. Uh, where's the bow tie, don't they? That's what I would have told myself. I would have said, dress more normal. I, I would have said that. I would have... Uh, you know, a lot of those choices I would have changed. I would have told myself to um, enjoy the process more. I still have to tell myself that now. I still don't enjoy the process as much as I should. I, I like the result a lot, but the process, you know, is always don't worry about the greenhouse twins. I say, we said, don't worry about the greenhouse twins. It's going to be fine. It's okay. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, what would you have told yourself? I was, think, I was thinking about this. So uh, uh, we have spoken about this a little bit before, but I have it here. This is my, I, I was into magic uh, young as well. And this is my school project on magic when I was about 10 or 12. And I would have told myself to spell conjuring correctly on the project's cover. Because <laughs> <laughs> I managed to fit in an extra uh, E into it that doesn't exist. So I think that would have been- You didn't want to buy another paper to redo that page? Um, cover, or was that cover sealed? Oh, that, that, that cover's sealed. This is stapled oh. on. There's, okay. Yeah, there's, there's, that, that's, yeah. So I would have said, look, you're not going to believe this, but in a few years' time, you're going to be talking to the legendary David Copperfield and get the word conjuring spelt correctly. <laughs> um, I'm in that so, book. I think you told me I'm in that book. You're in, that, you're in this book. You're in this book. This is unbelievable. Younger but you're a little younger than me, right? How many years younger than me? I, I'm, I'm, I'm 10 years younger than you. Wow. To the day actually um and uh yeah so i there's a front cover of a uh, a, a weekly british magic magazine called abracadabra and you're, you're on that front cover i'm gonna stop you for a second so so you wrote that when you're how old about 10 or 12 i think oh so i'm 22 yes so i'm 22 and let me see yes. let me see the cover let me see what they what they put. what the cover of abracadabra yes of course uh, one second. Where are they? Here it was. Here, here it is. Here it is. So photocopying wasn't very sophisticated in those days. So it's um, there. We go. I hope you can see David and Lonnie Anderson. Oh my God! Look at that. There we go. Again, there's another thing I would have told myself: smaller collars, smaller collars. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you've lost the bow tie by then. There you go. I got you know Lonnie was there, so I had to take it off. <laughs> So you've had this incredible career uh, and have this incredible career within uh, magic. Uh, tell us about the, and that's taking you all over the world performing. Tell us about the birth of the museum though. Where, where did that come from? Well, I was um, a friend of mine, Mike Caveney, a friend of ours actually, mm -hmm. came to me 30 years ago, something like that, and said, there's a museum, uh, a library of John Mulholland, who of course I knew was a great magic historian, he worked for the CIA using magic as a form of espionage to help all that clandestine activity. And uh, his museum, he had long passed on, was going to be sold, dispersed. He said, you got to rescue it. It's a good tax deduction. <laughs> I said, okay. All right. So I thought about it and I said, yes, uh, but really didn't understand. I didn't understand the value of it. I didn't know why. Uh, it was a bunch of really cool stuff that had to be kept together. Houdini stuff, Thurston Keller, thousands of magic books. It was an amazing archive. And I got it and I said, okay, I'll do it, posters. And uh, then I started understanding these lives matched my life. 
their journey matched my journey. Um, we learn, human beings learn a little bit. We get better at, at certain things, but we kind of repeat the same mistakes just as human beings. We, we, we do, unfortunately. Um, and I saw that the same thing that happened in all those past masters was happening to me in real time. And then it's suddenly, oh, I get this and I can use this to tell stories with it. I can tell stories. The museum is multiple stories. And um, uh, so suddenly, okay, I can do something with this stuff. You know, uh, I had a, a friend named uh, Dr. Robert Albo, who was the Raiders doctor. He had a giant collection of apparatus and I purchased that to kind of keep it all together. And I didn't really get it. And then I said, oh, I'll make it into a magic shop. Then suddenly I got it. Then it communicated an idea of a journey that many people took. It wasn't just stuff. It was wrapped and framed in a story. So all these things I've done is all been about storytelling, which is my little contribution to this art form. I tell stories that are very personal stories in my show. Uh, magicians had told stories before me, but they were always about the Far East or Africa or the, that kind of thing, or the Princess of Thebes. You know, my stories were personal, like a singer songwriter would tell stories about their own life. That's what I contributed to art. One of my things I contributed to, to magic. And the museum was the same thing. I could tell stories in the museum experience because these start, the, the, the lives are really, really in, interesting as we found out from this. And we both, writing this book, we both learned a lot, didn't we? I mean, really oh, just- Absolutely, absolutely. We knew a lot and of was, stuff. <laughs> and, and it's such a tremendous resource to, to delve into. I mean, you know, if you say, folks, you, know, you have one of the early versions of the, the classic soaring in half uh, effect there. Uh, you have Houdini's, apparatus you know his straight jackets and, and 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 so on as you look at this tremendous collection have you got a favorite exhibition exhibit rather is there something where you would go you know that that really speaks to me well the one thing that really does i can't really talk about it's a it's a gimmick a method that um made the first illusion the first illusion to me of my kind of illusion was a Houdin's ethereal lev uh, levitation, ethereal suspension, where he suspend his sun in the air, putting ether in the air. Ether was a very point of topic, uh, important point of conversation at that time in the 18, mid 1800s, where um, you could, they discovered a chemical that could make people go to sleep. That's pretty amazing. That's like an iPhone. Wow, it's an amazing thing. And he used that as a kind of a, a story device to tell the audience and actually have the audience smell this ether smell in the air while his son would levitate, the excuse for it. But the actual illusion device that made it work was put into my hands 20 years ago in France. And I began to cry because it was the beginning of, you know, all of everything we do. Um, magic happened beforehand, but stage illusion, that was the first of that kind. So finally having to possess that now, 20 years later for this museum, it is an amazing thing to me. Of course, they have the Houdini water torture cell, which is in the movie, Tony Curtis movie, to, to represent his death. Didn't happen that way, but that was the last illusion, the most famous illusion of the water torture cell. It's pretty amazing. His straight jacks and so forth. Houdin's automaton, like you said, the sawing in half illusions from many different people. We have many sawing in halves illusions and levitation devices and so forth. But um, I think those are the main things that really, you know, uh, you know, speak to me. Also, whatever exhibition exhibit is the newest one is the one that's most interesting to me. Uh, during COVID, we created, uh, let me see, there's a picture in the book here, let me see if I can find it. Um, the library, you know, this library here is an amazing library. Oh, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't have existed if, uh, if COVID, uh, unfortunately, you know, did a lot. A lot of damage but during that time we used that time to uh, to create that that library and a whole research center in addition to that so we tried to make the best out of a bad situation by that but that's the latest thing we're really proud of that you know the next thing we're doing will be a whole thing about magic sets that hasn't been done yet and puppetry which i love so i have all those exhibits about to 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 uh, be brought to that level where it's really really something i'd be proud of and, and you mentioned uh, the pandemic there. We do actually have a, a question which is about that. So I'll, I'll just segue into that uh, for the moment. 
Uh, what's your pandemic been like without touring and facing live audiences? That's obviously something you've done throughout your entire life. Uh, and then you've been forced to, uh, away from that. So how's it, how's it been? Well, we did create that. You know, I kept my crew working. If they wanted to work, they got had kept their jobs, which is, you know, uh, a nice thing for all of us because I was able to use their talents and their skills to create the library, the research center, and to tweak this place to get it to a you know level we really liked. You know, we worked on the book, obviously, uh, during that time. You know, every time you get hit down, you know, you get st struck down by something, it hurts for a while, right? You kind of go, oh, you had a bad review or a bad, you know, something bad is happening. And you kind of sit there for a minute and then you got to get up and do something about it. You can't just sit there. So, you know, we dealt with it to make use of it as, as best we possibly can. And, you know, we created stuff. I created some amazing new illusions, which are still being built. It takes a long time to create illusions. Um, and, uh, but we tried to do stuff that we could actually see pretty soon, which was libraries and all that stuff. We could actually, you know, fulfill that, that, that need to, to move forward, even in this environment. And in, in Vegas, where you're doing, you know, two shows, sometimes three shows a day, did, did, there, there, I think there were some times when that didn't happen because of the pandemic. Did, did you miss being on stage? I mean, sure. I mean, I really enjoy kind of, you know, communicating with an audience, you know. There's some entertainers, not just magicians, that should like, you know, when they're on vacation, they say, where's the applause? Where's the applause? You know, they don't know what to do. I'm not like that. As long as I'm moving forward in some way, as long as I'm creating things or if I'm, I feel like I'm accomplishing something, then suddenly um, I'm okay. I'm okay with that. You know, um, I developed a resort in the Bahamas and I love when I go there, I don't sit on the sun, I create stuff and uh, that makes me happy. And uh, I just need to do that. And I think there's a lot of people in, in my world, not just magic, but in communication, uh, they tell me the same thing. They just need to just do that. So it's not about applause or having the audience. And the audiences are great. You know, they really need to be amazed. They need to to dream. I, I'm very fortunate to have a, you know people there. And you watch their faces, and you know they they really want to be there. And some really need to be there. They need to be transported. And sticking with the museum for a moment, if one could travel back in time and you can see any performer, any magician uh, at all. Where would you go? Who would you see? I think first, Robert Houdin. And we, we should expect to explain to folks, this yeah. was a, a French magician, uh, seen as the father of modern magic, mainly because he took magic from the streets really onto the stage, made magic much more respectable. And, and so really sort of lays the foundations for, for modern day magic. And also an inventor, invented lots of things, um, you know, and used new technology. He invented, I think, the first smart home. You know, his house would open up electrically. You know, now, now every grocery store opens up, you know, the door like that. But um, it was a magic effect. It started as a magic thing to me. Wow, the door opens by itself. Today, we would, you know, wouldn't blink an eye. But then it was like, wow, incredible. He fed his horses with mechanisms that automatically, as a magic effect. Um, so that kind of magical thinking has really, uh, you know, been very useful today as we progress. Um, so I'd, I'd see his show. Um, my wife is French, so I'd have her translate uh, all this stuff. Uh, even though he did do his show in England. I wonder yes. if he spoke, do we know if he spoke in, in, in I don't know whether we know. I think at the time French would have been spoken fairly, I mean, it's, it's obviously spoken quite a lot anyway, but no, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. That's the second volume of, uh, of our history. There you go. You need more okay. pictures. <laughs> um, so I'd see his show and uh, have a conversation with him. I would, uh, I'd love to see Houdini. I don't have to see him. I've seen, seen what I need to see, but just to see Actually, no, I would love to see a Houdini show to see why the audience would sit there for an hour watching a, just a curtain while he was escaping behind it. But we should explain that because it is, I think it feels very alien to the sort of modern day uh, spectator. So, so Houdini would, would, would go into a trunk or whatever it was and, and be locked up. There'd be a cover raised and then he'd be working away allegedly trying to get out and the audience would just sit there and, and watch this, this essentially non-event on stage knowing he was working away. Yeah, would that exist today? I don't think so. You know, I, you know, when I've done 
that kind of thing, escape things. I, it was a great effort made to have a visual kind of result. So you could see me escaping from things. So you watch the content, you know, watch the raft go over Niagara Falls. You know, you watch um, burning ropes above me, you know, burning while I start to escape. Um, you know, or an imploding building, being in a safe and watching the building to implode, some kind of content that a modern audience would be able to, you know, hold on to and not go click, you know. How long would a how long would a Vegas audience sit there, do you think, if there was a scent if they're just looking at a raised cover on a trunk? I wouldn't have two two minutes they'd be looking at the keno machine. Keno, you play the keno. Anyway, the point is, and the casino wouldn't like it. They want, you know, you back, you know, losing your money out there. No, I think there needs to be content out there. And I think that, you know, movies came, you know, and then film, television came and now the internet where the boy, it's the TikTok machine is like quick, you know, it's, you got, you got it. Movie trailers aren't movie trailers. There's a trailer of the trailer at the top of the movie trailer for the, for the short attention span. Literally before the trailer plays, there is a 10 second moment that's supposed to grab you for the rest so that just shows you how far our attention span is you know is that good i don't know if that's good or bad you know it's like uh it is what it is it well it brings us to the second question very nice which is nicely which is the uh what developments of streaming the, the impact that streaming has had on magic uh, both good and bad, uh, actually. Any any thoughts on that? Because as you say, you know, now you go to TikTok and you see these kind of instant magic tricks that look lovely, but uh, there's not much of a story there, to say the least. So, what 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 are your thoughts on streaming and uh, and internet and magic? Well, it's good and bad. What you go first? What do you think? <laughs> you have um, you, you still a plug for you. If you go on YouTube to watch uh, Quirkology, the Quirkology videos, you do a wonderful job. A very short understandable, clear, amazing, illusionary things. Quirkology, check it out. You've had to deal with it yourself. So what do you think? Well, with Quirkology, I think, that, so with both magic, magicians obviously hide the secret of the illusion. And the reason for that is the secret is sometimes very simple and normally quite disappointing. So with Quirkology, what we did was try to create methods that were kind of interesting and, and fun. And so the whole thing holds up. Uh, but they're pretty short clips. Nowadays, I'm seeing really short stuff where one thing instantly transforming into another. And for me, it's it's kind of bubblegum rather than anything that's got real meaning or any real substance to it. I mean, you, you spoke about storytelling in your own work. That brings meaning to, to, to the magic. So for me, and, and also you have the sharing of, of methods as well. I mean, it's very easy for people to find out how things were done. Uh, so for me, it's not a big plus, but 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 maybe you see it differently. No, I see it the same. I think, you know, it's hard. You know, what we do is hard. And um, I've got to create new technology, mostly new technology, each time I create something new. So it's not just a new song on the piano, which exists. I have to create a new piano each time. If I do something really great, and, you know, I hope to be great, uh, spectacular. You work so hard at something, you really want it to be something that resonates. And by resonates, I mean something that really lasts and people remember it, don't forget it. So you try to find things that will be like the godfather, you know what I'm saying? Be like Citizen Kane. You want to aspire to this level of, of, uh, of excellence, right? Um, and uh, you get close sometimes, you get closer sometimes. Um, and um, for that to happen, you need to lay a foundation of understanding and um, a journey of sorts. There has to be a little bit of a journey or else if it's one moment, it's cool and it lasts. Wow, it's a great thing, you share it. And then it goes right through your head in one ear and out the other. Wonderful moment, really fun. But I think for it to, to resonate and stick with an audience, uh, you have to do something that kind of takes them to some kind of story arc that they can relate to. And that's really important. That's hard. In magic, to have something to really relate to is, is a, a very important thing to me. And I work really hard on it. And, and let's talk about that in the context of uh, the Statue of Liberty vanish. I mean, just the, the symbolism of that, the meaning of that. It's not just a, a 10 second clip of this thing suddenly vanishing. Obviously, there's a lot of surround to that. Do you want to speak to that a little bit? 
Sure. Um, I did a, I, I vanished an airplane one year on TV and um, it was a thing I, I thought it was going to be good. It got amazing reactions and it really kind of, it kind of pissed me off because I wanted them to like everything else in the show. There was all something that was very personal to me, stories and, and things I cared about, dance and movement and so on. And I vanished a big object. People went crazy. Uh, it was a viral before viral. And the next thing I did, I made sure it had some kind of meaning and some kind of truth to it. And uh, the Statue of Liberty was that idea. If I'm going to vanish something big, it's going to, big, it's going to have something that would, uh, you know, people could experience in their own way. My mother, you know, came here on a boat, saw the statue, I heard about that. They thought the streets were paved with gold in, in America. Really, they thought the streets were gold. Uh, they weren't gold. There was some gum and some cigarettes, but no, it wasn't. Um, rude awakening for my mom, but she did tell the story about seeing the statue for the first time. Of course, as a kid, you visit it, you know, in New York or New Jersey, you see this thing. And, um, and the fact that we take our freedom for granted, you know, is about how we just really take it for granted. And although we read, uh, see in the news or on TV, countries that are really going through some terrible situations around the world, uh, how we don't really pay attention to the fact that we should really appreciate uh, this very fragile thing called freedom and liberty. Um, so I wanted to talk about that. So the statue of was that, you know, it was an opportunity to tell that story. Um, I went to see uh, Frank Capra, who was one of my film idols it's a wonderful life and uh, mr smith goes to washington his company was called liberty films uh, and i begged him to help me with this uh, illusion he uh, said i'll do it if you fail i want you to fail at it i said mr cap i cannot fail to do this cbs won't like that uh, but i finally convinced uh, this great film director to help me write kind of the surrounding uh, point of this which was to uh, to not take freedom for granted to kind of symbolize uh, just for a moment, what the world would be, would be like without liberty and freedom. And uh, so, and it's lasted, you know, that idea, besides it being spectacular illusion, not my best illusion, honestly, but it's one that has, you know, captured people's imagination. I did it for a live audience, people on the, the, the harbor looking there, they saw it happen too. Uh, and, and I was on television as well. Uh, there's a lot of false methods on TV, some that I, you know, on the internet, I should say, that I put out there all kinds of uh, things, misinformation that I put, but the illusion itself is something people seem to remember. And um, yeah, I think it's big because not only was it big in scale, but also resonated on a different level. And let's go from a huge illusion like that to a very small one, because uh, I was going to ask you to, to teach uh, viewers a magic trick uh, so that they could say that uh, David Copperfield has taught them a, a magic trick. Sure. And I suggested, I think probably one of the first tricks that, that, that we learn as, as kids, which is the, the rubber band trick. So I don't know whether you, you have the rubber band there and uh, you're able to, to <laughs> show us something. And to have it. You know, this is an illusion where you uh, and I have full screen here. Uh, we have a rubber band around these two fingers here like this. And you... Pass it oh, around. very good. I love that reaction. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> That's great. It's uh, great. It's here and then, and then it goes like that. Oh. And the amazing thing is you can really make it um, kind of a, a challenge where it's on these two fingers here and you can lock it into place like this. <laughs> Hope these don't break. These are old. <laughs> on these two fingers right there. And uh, there it is right there. And even though it's locked on, it'll jump. It's oh, like look at that. And you two at home can get reactions from English people like that. <laughs> That's great. It's great. Can we teach you? I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm really rather enjoying seeing you perform that because uh, there's a lot going on there. There's a lot more going on than I've normally seen that, that rubber band uh, illusion. So, uh, uh, so uh, should we get into the, the, the basics? Are you happy to, I know magicians, we're not very uh, comfortable uh, talking about methods, but I think this particular one. Okay. This, we, we use this in a pro pro program called Project Magic, which is magic as a form of therapy for people with disabilities. You, you can be an able-bodied person and learn this. Uh, what we do here is we have a rubber band like this and you have the other one tied across the top. And uh, you can take your thumb and put it in here. This is a secret, by the way. Take your thumb in here like this and stretch it like that, making a triangle. Okay, so the thumb goes in here. This is the secret part. And all the fingers go into that loop and you remove your thumb. 
Nobody's supposed to see that part. So that's usually done off camera or behind the scenes. What they see is around this part. Don't show them that. Not very good. Not going to get a reaction. Not going to get a whoa <laughs> from England. No. You show just this side on these two fingers like this. And when you open your hand, it jumps. It's great. How did that work? I have no idea. It's very hard to do it in the opposite way because your thumbs don't work like that. But all the fingers go into the space. So anyway, what I do to really do it hard, you can keep everything in view and do that like this. That, that was the bit I liked. I like that. Boom. Look at that. So that's pretty cool. You can do it without this too. So again, thumb goes in here. All the fingers are going to remove the thumb. Only show this side and you got it. Any improvements? Uh, no improvements. My, my one's far worse. I, I didn't know about the thumb. I've always just been doing it by pulling my finger, putting across like that, and then then doing it. So this the, the, the thumb. I'm very excited about that. Um, we, we should say to folks. That, I mean, this goes back to uh, 1911 when when this was invented oh. by by uh, Stanley Collins, a British magician. Oh sure, you take her. see that you're witnessing something because every day, <laughs> always the English guys invented all the good stuff. That's it's why tough. I thought it. One of the reasons I thought it'd be a good illusion uh, to teach people is that it, it actually kind of originates in Britain. Uh, now Stanley Collins, uh, when did he pass away? Uh, 1912. It was, it was the, 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 the shock of this illusion that uh, he invented <laughs> it in 1911. 12 months later, that's it. Well, uh, no, I've, <laughs> I've no idea. I've no idea. Um, he wasn't a very popular magician. No. Hmm. Yeah. I think he was quite honest about other magicians' acts. Oh. Yes. You're right about it? Yeah, I believe so. Yes. Um, but, but the point being, that's over, you know, it's 110 years old, this, this illusion. And, and still magicians are playing with it. I mean, magic evolves. The idea of putting the band across the top came much later. His original one was just the jump. And, and I think that's what makes magic really so fascinating is that it does evolve. And again, that speaks to the museum, why, why you know, one holds on to the past. I think so. And, you know, you look not to copy other people, even though many magicians do copy other people, you look and see the foundation that's built and then you add to it. You know, as you know, I've had many illusions that are based on the theme of sawing somebody in half. And myself and my team reinvented that called the death saw. Google it, um, or flying, which takes place, starts with a levitation. But then, you know, I, I realize that people don't dream about levitating, really. They dream about flying. So I work really hard to create an illusion where I fly around. Uh, and, it's, and it's pretty good, you know, and we keep moving forward because we stand on the shoulders of giants, um, not just taking their ideas, but just maybe the foundation of what they were trying to express. You can do it in a whole nother way. And, and again, it's this secret world of magic. Magicians document what, what they do. And that, that library, you know, sort of tens of thousands of books, they document the effects, the history, the methods, like no other performing art. And, and yet none of that's normally available to the public. And, and you have to know it in order to do what you've done, which is really take the art form forward. I think so. Why do you think we document it like that? Just for, for self-preservation or for just be part of history? Why do magicians do that? A lot, you know, a lot of very fine uh, magic creations were created by amateur magicians, not famous performers, right? A lot of people, you know, do that. Why do you think? I, I would like to think that it's making, that, that people realize the importance of that for making the contribution to the art of, of magic. I mean, if you are you know, an, an amateur working away and you come up with a, a new move or something, then you can actually part of the canon of magic. And at some point, you know, a hundred years later, somebody opens a book, reads something, go, my goodness, we can improve on the rubber band illusion or, or whatever it is. So I would hope, a bit like the museum, you know, it's about thinking about the future and making your mark on it, really, by, by recording what you're doing at the moment. When I was 12, I uh, invented a trick with a pen, mento pen, and I was lucky enough to hang around this shop, the, the real version of the shop. And I showed it to a guy named Harry Lorraine, who's still with us, 95 year old mm. Harry Lorraine, who was writing the newest Tarbell course in magic, the newest uh, copy, Tarbell 7. And he liked the, the, the trick I invented. I was 12 years old. And uh, my invention got into Tarbell. And um, 
It was, you know, I, I'm not sure how great it was, but it, it was nice. They thought it was good enough to put in the book. And, um, and it was a big honor to this day to have a little contribution from a 12-year-old kid. Uh, my little invention is in this important series of books. So that's, I know. There we you... go. There we go. Yeah. And also, I mean, how many magicians today are inspired by you? How many of them say, my goodness, it was watching David Copperfield, those specials that, that, that inspired me. To this. So, you know, a huge impact on the art of magic. Thank you. Um, in, in terms of your illusions, as you look back on this huge body of work, what, what's your favorite and least favorite items? Are you talking about in the museum or in the- I, th I think the, 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 the ones you have performed. Oh. Is there something which you gone, you know, it didn't quite work or this is the one that really stands out for me? Oh, I had a lot that didn't work. <laughs> you know, I, I, <laughs> I fail big. I fail big. Um, you know, I, which is good because I take big risks. Uh, you know, I talk about the three P's of mine, passion, preparation, and persistence. Those are the three things that kind of uh, are my secrets. You know, you have to be really passionate about something, really want something really badly, uh, want to have a reason for doing it. And then the preparation, I'd work really hard finding every single possible way of doing something, uh, failing doing this. And that goes to the, uh, the persistence part. And they need a lot of persistence because there's a lot of things gonna come at you in life that people are gonna say, it can't be done, it's ridiculous. So those three things really have, have uh, uh, helped me a lot. You know, I worked many years to fly and, uh, and we have all kinds of versions of, of making it happen. And, ones weren't so good we, and finally we got something that we, we we thought was pretty good and it's it stood the test of time um you know i uh sometimes you do something and you don't like it at the time and people there's elements of it that are decent i did a bermuda triangle show and it, after it was done i felt i really failed but then people have had me revisit it and it's it's there's elements that are kind of interesting and not not too bad but i was really you know convinced the idea of the story that takes place in this mysterious place was the way to go. So, you know, we all look at things we want to redo and there's very few things you go back and say, you know, not much I would have changed about that. There's very few things that are of that level where you don't want to change it, you know. And, and we, we should talk about the creation of magic because I, I think magicians have this unusual way of seeing the world that they, they, they're so used to achieving the impossible that if somebody says, oh, you've got to make this chair disappear, most people go, what are you talking about? You can't make a chair disappear. But magicians instantly have ways of, of doing that. H how do you go about creating magic? Is it the effect? Is it the idea of the band jumping from two fingers to the other that comes first? Or is it some crazy, interesting method that then drives that effect? It's, it's both ways, as you know. Um, you know, I will, somebody will bring me a particular great piece of technology and I'll say, that is really great technology. How can I use that for a magic effect? So the technology or technique or the, the, uh, the invention of the uh, methodology will come first. And I'll reverse engineer it to create an effect uh, based on that. But then also I'll have a dream of, of flying, you know? And I'll say, what do I got to do to make this work? You know, in my show currently, I wanted a spaceship to appear. I wanted an alien to appear and and interact with that alien. I want to travel through time and have to meet my father again, you know, to make things right that weren't quite right. And so the story all came first and everything, you know, finding the technology or inventing in this case, inventing technology to make those things happen, happened after the fact with the need to do it. Much like you write a screenplay, you know what you want to do, and then you have very smart people come in and they know the special effects and the lighting, all this kind of stuff. It happens like that a lot, where I have to invent new technology to suit the story that I'm, I'm trying to express. And, um, you know, I mean, um, I had a dinosaur toy as a kid and I lost it. Uh, so to bring that dinosaur back uh, was a need that I had. So. I had to, I was able to use something from the Barclay house, a, a method that I had in the, this ghost thing that I did years before. I was able to use a method from that, improve it and use it to make this dinosaur appear. And the di dinosaur is 30 feet tall, uh, but it's, it's not a toy thing, but it's, it's big in scale. So that came 
from story first. But like you said, a lot of times you'll find a great piece of technology or you'll invent a new piece of technology. You just did, in fact. You, had a, you yourself had an idea of a mind-reading effect with a book. We can't tell how it works, but it was the, the idea came first. And then the idea of the technique came first and you invented the story, the effect to go around that idea. Am I correct? Yes, that, that, that's correct. I mean, in fact, with that one, we don't know if it works, so I haven't actually performed it yet, um, but, but, but fingers crossed. Yeah, so that was, yeah, that was taking a bit of psychology and thinking, oh, hold on a second, that, that's, that there's a way of, of doing some magic in there, which is why I think magic's, yeah, yes. I mean, it's, it's, it's all about lateral thinking and seeing the world in a, in a different way. We're so lucky because, you know, it's hard, it's hard. But we're still playing, you know, we're playing with that. You know, you're playing with words and books and this and that. And, you know, I'm playing with dinosaurs and all this stuff. And it's hard, but I'm still so lucky that I get to do this instead of, uh, you know, sweeping the floor. Even though I like sweeping the floor, honestly. I like I actually did, today. <laughs> I got this great Dyson vacuum and it's kind of fun. <laughs> um, we have uh, another question here which is how would you compare magicians as performers compared to comedians or musicians? So I guess the difference between working as a magician and a comedian and a musician. What would you say? You go first. What do you think? Well, I, I think what's interesting is that uh, unlike the other two, well, a couple of things. With a comedian, you know whether you've got the laugh or not. With a magician, I don't know that you know whether you've fooled the audience. So there's a, a, a kind of issue there. Till the second, I think with the up, go. Till the second show, then you know you talk. <laughs> <and, and, laughs> keep going. Yeah. And also, I think magicians are odd, aren't they? Because there's a sense of, of withholding something from the audience that the comedian and musicians can display their skill. It's very open. Where magicians, a big part of what's happening is concealed and and so i think it's easier certainly with the musician to tell whether you're with uh, having a um opposite a very skilled performer with a magician it's sometimes harder to know that those, those would be my thoughts off the top of my head but what you're saying is i'm making it very clear a bad magician who fools an audience will be thought is good sometimes a guy that's able to not does that performing skill or writing skill or, or you know just is engaging if they do a piece of magic. And this is unfortunate. If it fools the audience, I'm like, wow, that's fantastic, you know? And that's sad, you know? And when a musician, you'll know if they're a bad singer, you know the kind of, are they Adele or are they, you know, somebody else? You know, uh, they'll know immediately because they're educated. You know, for me, um, I really try to involve the audience. Even the secret stuff, I kind of, make them audience make the audience feel hopefully that they're part of my world that they're, they're part of it they're part of i'm not trying to be better than them or smarter than them. usually i'm not smarter than them but um but i think i try to take them in so they're really part of it which is what music and comedy does music and comedy is very inviting yeah. you're you're invited to be part of the music to experience with the singer and comedy uh, I know what he's talking about. That's funny because I know in magic, for some reason, when I started doing this, there was a lot of magicians who were very kind of like, I'm better than you. And I thought that was wrong. For magic to really succeed, magic had to go, you're part of this. I'm part of you, you know? Everything that I, every time I fall on stage and it got shot on camera, I'd use that take. I want them to see me fail. I want them to see all that. So I'm more part of, you know, a familiar, familiar person. It makes the magic way stronger. Um, uh, I think the fact that in comedy, everyone knows the rules. It, you know, uh, in music, that if it sounds good, it makes you feel something. In comedy, if it makes you, hits you viscerally, it makes you laugh, you know it. In magic, you have to kind of educate the audience a bit because they don't know what's good or bad magic. They're just fooled by it. Um, so uh, I've lasted a, a while because I, I care about all those things. I care about what I say. I care about how how... The, it visually looks, musically, how it's lit, all those things. And also a very important point, which is to, to do something the audience can really relate to. And uh, all those things I think are what, you know, are important for every art form and especially magic. I, I, I think that's, that's right. I mean, it's, it's a co-collaboration, isn't it? That you're inviting the audience in. It's not that you're better than them or it's a combative or anything like that. And hopefully the book 
you know, does start to tell people about this secret world, which is a, a rather wonderful world. It's just one which is hidden away from them. Um, just before we, we finish up, uh, yeah. the uh, stories, uh, favourite stories from the uh, from the book, as we were researching it, we came up with these sort of wonderful anecdotes about these rather strange folks that have inhabited magic throughout the years. What was a highlight for you? Oh, God. I mean, there's really a lot of them. This, by the way, I was going to say this is a great Christmas gift. It is. It is. It's are amazing. Phenomenal. And it's a very affordable uh, coffee table book that's incredible. Buy 10 of them. Give it as gifts to your friends because it's really that good. Uh, and it is an invitation <laughs> to the world of magic uh, that's really, really fun. Um, you know, in this book, we talk about um, Arthur Lloyd. Arthur Lloyd was a, the human index. He'd come on stage and anything made of paper, uh, any card, business card, uh, uh, you know, Lions Club card, you, the audience would call that and he'd produce it. He'd make it appear. Uh, really remarkable, funny act. And the method was that he was the human index. Did he say that in this day? He, his body was filled with all these cards, this outfit, 40 pounds of stuff. And he'd know exactly where to pull out. It was a secret code that he had. He'd pull out whatever the audience would call for out of his coat. And it was very funny and really miraculous. Um, I bought that coat and the actual thing to put in the museum. Um, and hoping that I'd discover the secret of his, his math, let's say, his logic of where he, how he, would he do it? I bought this so excited. I bought it from a magician, believe it or not. Um, and when I received it, all the cards were put into a box and the coat was over here. I said, wait a minute, what, what did you do? What, what's, the, what's the method? <laughs> it's all out. I, don't, I can, can't find the secret. I can't discover the map. He said, well, it was a little dirty. I wanted to dry clean it for you, the guy said. So Arthur Lloyd is in heaven smiling that his secrets are, are kept. We're, we're never going to know. We're never going to know. Amazing. Incredible. I, th I think my favourite is, is Houdini in Glasgow. I believe he's in Glasgow in Scotland. And he would, when he arrived in a, a, a town as a publicity stunt, he'd asked to be locked inside a, a prison cell and he would then escape. So he's locked inside a, a prison a cell in, in Scotland and he's working away and he can't pick the lock and it's going on for hours. He's in there for two hours and it's, it's sweating and he's starting to uh, get very anxious about it all. And this is one of the few locks that he can't pick and he can't figure out what's going on. And then he leans on the prison door and it swings open because it wasn't locked in the first place. So he's trapped in the cell by his own assumption that they would have locked the, uh, the cell. So I love the idea of this, this kind of great mind actually tripping himself up with his own sophistication, because actually that is a kind of what happens in magic shows. You know, audiences are very sophisticated, but they are sophisticated and make assumptions all the time. And magicians exploit those assumptions and do something impossible. And I think, you know, we have discovered that the smartest people in the world are the easiest to amaze because they have so much logic and form of concepts and precepts of what reality is that it can be very easily exploited when yeah. the methods might just be a piece of sleight of hand not scientific um yuri geller who's now my pal you know was debunked by many magicians because he was fooling scientists because he knew that they were smart and he would use a very simple method to make those things happen and had them really baffled him yeah. well uh david i supremely busy so thank you very much for finding the time uh, to, uh, to chat today thank you for what you've done for the art of magic uh, it's been uh, uh, phenomenal and uh, a pleasure chatting again thank you very much thank you everybody christmas gifts and uh thanks david and richard thanks to those of you who sent in the questions again david copperfield's book is david copperfield's history of magic it is available wherever books are sold, and you can purchase a signed copy in the link below. As we like to say, go on gently. <laughs>